but that's not part of my time. I have no conflicts for this presentation. <laughs> so the goal in a functional amputation truly is to find that anatomical level of an infection-free extremity where arterial perfusion is adequate to heal and allow the patient to continue with independent ambulation with the best long-term immobility, right? It seems like such a simple concept. The sky is blue, the trees are green, but somehow we find ourselves in the mountains on these slippery slopes because we feel that arterial perfusion is optimized. We feel that we've gotten the infection, we're addressing it, but still some of these wounds and amputations don't heal. So this is a challenge for all of us. If we look at amputations and the most recent evidence or data from January in diabetes care, there seems to be a hint that there's a resurgence of increase in non-traumatic lower extremity amputations, particularly in the diabetic patient population. So this data from the National uh, um, Inventory Survey of inpatients noted that between the years of 2009 or 2010 to the current, there has been a bump in the total number of amputations, particularly in that diabetic patient population. So where for two decades we've noticed a 50% decrease in amputations, we now over the last five years from 2010 to 2015 have noticed increase particularly of lower extremity minor amputations, but of all amputation levels. And this is really fueled by young and middle-aged diabetic persons, those between the ages of 18 and 44 and 45 to 64. And men especially. And this is at all levels, but we can see the predominance of lower extremity toe amputations. And this is probably an underreporting because we know a lot of these lower extremity amputations also occur in ambulatory surgery settings, not all inpatient services. If we look at really what does the function play in a lower extremity amputation, we have two goals, right? Or we have two choices, minor, distal to the ankle joint or major above the ankle joint, proximal to the ankle joint, and it really becomes a question of, you know, what do you believe? What are you going to fight for? So Wukic looked at functional measures or markers and found that those who are successful at saving their limbs, not having a major extremity amputation, were more fearful of losing their extremity than of death itself. And the goal to function is a plantar grade foot. Also, with those with transtibial amputations, they were three times more likely to die within the first year of surgery. That was an independent risk factor, not the comorbidities, but actually the amputation level itself. But two-thirds were proximal with the prosthetic and had increased energy expenditure, as could be expected. On the flip side, we have an author, Michael Dillon, out of Australia, who's a researcher and engineer who's really focused a lot of attention in the last decade on looking at the dysvascular partial foot amputations in relation to a transtibial amputation or a major extremity amputation. And his bent has really been Let's go for the proximal limb amputation. Let's forget all this lower extremity stuff, the wound care, the lower extremity amputations, the revascularization, because after a year, this is very functional. People get over it. And he has the experience of his wife who had breast cancer, had elective mastectomies, and likens it to a transtibial amputation. Let's just get rid of it. Let's get rid of the problem. I think most of us here today, though, may not agree with that approach. So his major downside was that the mortality is increased, okay? That's it. Well, to me, I think that is probably the penultimate. So if we look at a transmetatarsal amputation, what can we achieve? You know, what can we rely on? We feel like the arterial perfusion is good here. Dr. Shishabor alluded to this earlier. Kind of, we kind of have to pull up, you know, pick your surgeon. Pick your interventionalist in a sense, okay? Because we look at this and in all regards, we thought the arterial blood flow was optimized, we thought infection was controlled, but yet we see a wound kind of taking a tank, right? So maybe that surgeon didn't have gentle tissue handling, maybe that surgeon shouldn't have closed this transmetatarsal amputation site. So there's that intangible factor of, of success with functional amputations that might be outside of the box. Did anyone see this match last Sunday? I mean, oh my gosh, what a talent on the court. Five hours of, of, of pure perfection from both players, Djokovic and Federer. You know, these were you know, striving to be the GOATs, the greatest of all time players. Well, in our field, and what I know in Cleveland, we do have a player like that. Mm -hmm. So that's someone maybe you're going to want to refer to, right? You want that person who in their hands is going to do everything, not because they have the skill set only, but because they have the desire, they have the drive who are going to call you because they're really committed to trying to save extremities. So we do have to look more, though, at outcomes, OK? And this is a study, a recent study, that was actually surprising. Speaking about the timing of arterial revascularization, they set out to look, after transmetatarsal amputations retrospectively, 
Did it matter if the procedure happened before the TMA or after the TMA? And they were quite surprised that it didn't matter. But what they did find is when they looked at endovascular versus open procedures after TMAs, that nearly 50% of the endovascular approach procedures went on to higher level amputations. And this was in contradistinction to 13% with open. And they, they concluded that there was more success with the open procedure versus the percutaneous or endovascular, okay? Does this apply to our practice? I don't think so, but this is the current trend. And looking at this one study, it forces us and encourages us to look at our own results and, and report it. Similarly, in this recent study of heel ulcers, they were looking to note, does endovascular heal any better or the same as an open procedure for a heel ulcer? We all know these are the worst of the worst, right? The sickest patients, those that go on and are at high risk of major lower extremity amputation with heel ulcers. And what they found under the blue curve is the amputation-free survival of open procedures, and then under the green is the endovascular. At very similar uh, rates throughout 12 months, 24 months, 48 months, 72 to 120 months, we can see that the amputation-free survival was much more with open. And they re concluded that the results suggest that open vascular surgery should be offered more often as opposed to the current practice, okay? Is this true? I don't know, it's one report, not huge numbers, but it's something that we have to deal with and we need to report our outcomes if we feel that ours are different. So one thing that we're doing um, in, at the Cleveland Clinic is doing a lot of these TCPO2s. Right or wrong, it's what we have. So before I'm gonna do a definitive amputation level, I'll check, look at that reading of 40. I'll look for a response for hyperbaric, for oxygen challenge, and know whether this patient should be sent postoperatively for hyperbarics. So it's one technique. Other studies have looked at toe perfusion, when there are toes, of a 45 level as being a cutoff. Others have looked at chromosomes. But pedal perfusion, whether it's your anterior tibial artery vessel or your pedal loop, we need objective measurements to, to tell us you know, what level of amputation can become functional and successful. And the same front with regards to infection, something that we've used most recently is the microlite fluorescence signaling for bacteria, looking for pseudomonas and staph and strep in the wound. And what it has done and challenged me to do is debride more. So we can see the image, how much better it is once we do an aggressive debridement and, you know, compared to the former before debridement. And looking at this case, it was challenging. This patient's here for a third opinion, has seen plastic surgery and vascular surgery, and it started with an Achilles wound on the back of his ankle, which was treated with debridement, then a latissimus dorsi muscle flap, and then in him doing his dressing changes, he starts an ulcer on the top of the dorsal foot. What happens? Plastic surgery actually took out his medial column. So a few months ago, he had his medial column removed. He has negative pressure therapy at home, tripped over the back, and dislocated his midfoot, so comes to the emergency room. So really with nothing else but below the knee amputation offered to him, he's pleading and praying among everyone looking for help. He does not want a below the knee amputation at this time of his life. 62 years old, running for county auditor again. We can see that vascular component is part of his past medical history, but not the main player here. It's really the infection, the osteomyelitis is the issue, along with the open wound in the bad location. How can we salvage this or not have a major lower extremity amputation that's going to be rough? So what we did was we staged it. So staging has been shown to be somewhat effective. Eradicate the infection first, have a good soft tissue envelope. We use the Masonix debrider in the OR. Aerocept is another thing that we've added over the last year. Put negative pressure wound therapy on for a few days, see if we can get viable tissue. And here is our, our last stage. After two or three days, after debridement and uh, installation therapy, we feel it's viable. And this is his definitive step, taking that lateral plantar aspect, flapping it, closing it, and then using uh, mesenchymal stem cells, negative pressure wound therapy for the rest. A long road. Two, three months later, we can see still with that original wound, actually, but his flap and his chopard amputation, uh, disarticulating the foot from the talus and the calcaneus is effective. And, you know, for chopard amputations, which I feel are kind of on the rise, more reports of it, we have to have rigid follow-up, rigid bracing, real realistic expectations for him as an alternative to a major lower extremity amputation. So in conclusion, it's not limb salvage, it's life salvage. And really fighting for our patients to come up with a functional level and with the goals of restoring adequate perfusion, eradicating infection. There's a lot of technologies out there. Cost is an issue and getting them covered. And the manpower, who has lots of resources in their own clinic to cover and do all these tests, but you know, we have to try to find a time and find a way it works in order to help um, get real good outcomes and report them. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Botek. Now we're gonna welcome to the podium Raghu Kalori from Ohio Health. 
He's going to talk to us about mixed venous and arterial ulcers and how he approaches them.